what we're talking about today is in the context of the major report uh, on land for housing, which the uh, Scottish Land Commission published earlier in the summer, that envisages quite a radical change in the process of development in Scotland. And one of its recommendations was for uh, what we call place pioneers. So I just briefly want to summarize uh, because I'm not sure everyone will have had a chance to read uh, that report in detail, what the concept of place pioneers is that the Commission put forward. And really four elements to this. First of all, um, we see this as a way to turn surplus public land and buildings and problematic privately owned sites into immediate development opportunities in order to produce more affordable housing um, in town centres and remote rural areas and obviously associated development as well. Secondly, Place Pioneers implies a three-way partnership between the landowner, government and alternative types of developers who are not at the moment that prominent or not as prominent as they might be. So we're th talking about community bodies, we're talking about housing associations, we're talking about SMEs. Thirdly, uh, the concept's obviously not new, but the Commission argues that it needs to be reinvigorated and scaled up through a new recyclable fund. And it requires a strong commitment of expertise and support from key public agencies, such as local planning authorities, Scottish Futures Trust, Architecture and Design Scotland, and so on. And finally, the kind of schemes that would um, act as pioneers uh, would help rebuild public sector skills and expertise in making development happen. And that's essential as a precursor to the much greater public interest led development, which the Commission has been promoting. So I think what I'm particularly interested in to hear this afternoon is, is how practical is this as a concept and, and what, what needs to be done in practice to get it up and running uh, as soon as possible. So without further ado, I want to move on to our speakers. And our first speaker is Richard Cairns, who is strategic advisor for the Clyde Mission, a national place and mission focused program to make the Clyde an engine of sustainable and inclusive growth for the city, the region and Scotland. And he's also strategic advisor to the Glasgow city region on the regional economy. So before I pass over to Richard, can I ask everyone to mute themselves if they've not already done so and uh, to keep yourself muted, uh, obviously, unless I bring you in. Richard, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. Could you just, could you just gently wave if everyone can hear me just so that I can check? Yes, all seems fine. Good. Well, Firstly, thank you, David, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, speaking entirely personal, I'd like to congratulate the Land Commission on the report that was published in the summer. I think it's, it's a seminal piece, and I think it helps to set the tone for what the direction of travel needs to be. It's also one of the reasons why Shona Glenn of the Land Commission has been invited to chair and lead the vacant and derelict land mission of the Clyde Mission, um, you know, to bring that level of strategic sort of foresight to the whole process. Um, <clears throat> allow me to just give you a, a small piece of background. <clears throat> I am currently seconded, but used to work for Western Bartonshire Council, one of the smallest councils in the country. Over roughly the last five to seven years, Western Bartonshire Council has won uh, the RICS Best Regeneration Project in Britain, I had the pleasure of going to London, where most people hadn't the foggiest idea who we were or where we were from, uh, to take the award for the best RICS, best regeneration project in Britain. 16 Church Street, if anyone wants to look it up, that was 2019. <clears throat> We've also delivered one of the largest regeneration projects in the country on the, on the former shipyards at Queen's Quay, and that includes um, Britain's largest uh, low carbon water sourced heat pump district heating network, uh, which is going to be a big ticket item at COP in four weeks time. Now, why, and all of it incidentally, including hundreds of new home, new social homes, all of it 
on vacant and derelict land of one sort or another. Um, so those are those are credentials, as it were, nothing more than that. And I think the point I want to make about all of this, having been involved in doing this kind of thing for some time, and something that may well be evident to most of the people on this call, this is not easy to do. If it was easy to do, the market would be doing it and extracting value and profit from it. This is not easy to do. This is extremely difficult to do. Um, some of the things that I think it needs, if one, if one aspires to be a place pioneer, let's think of it that way. Some of the things it needs, vision and courage, no question. It requires discipline and rigor to be able to assemble projects that will actually deliver what you want and that actually add up. It needs expertise across a wide range of disciplines, well beyond the conventional technical disciplines that we might be familiar with. It requires patience, obviously, and it requires political will because you know place pioneering does not always sit easily with short to medium term political ambitions. And it can often uh, you know, span the time scale beyond the term of office of any given administration. In fact, usually does. Um, the, I mentioned the, the expertise point. The technical challenges of doing this, any kind of development on vacant and derelict land, especially in a world where we're striving towards net zero and so on and so forth. I wouldn't want to minimize those technical challenges, but in my experience, they're actually the easier part the difficult part are the legal and financial and commercial challenges of actually making developments work, especially if you have to work in any kind of partnership or concert with the private sector. In terms of the role councils can play, I think councils have got a, can potentially play a strong role as place pioneers for a whole variety of reasons, not necessarily to the exclusion of other actors, but councils are there and councils are vested in the place. And I think that's important and is something that should not be overlooked. Um, but in order for councils to play that pace pioneering role, they need strong visionary planning. Western Bartonshire Council has been very fortunate in that we have been blessed with first class visionary planners who've been able to help make some of these things happen. I also would be remiss of me not to say that in my view, councils should expect and would be able to perform the place pioneer role better if they had equity of funding with RSLs and other bodies in terms of funding for the provision of social housing from Scottish government. They need to be able to take a long-term view, which is not easy. Um, and so those are the, the basic roles as place pioneers. A couple of other deliberately slightly provocative thoughts. I wonder at a place pioneering scale, because I think scale matters in this stuff, that whether doing these things at a regional scale, and I say this with both my Clyde mission and my Glasgow City region hats on, whether attempting to do some of these things at a regional scale might be better. Allow me to elaborate on why I might think that. I think it offers the potential to bundle up smaller sites rather than seeking to do them in a kind of pepper pot approach. So there, there is something in that, and I'm genuinely interested in that as an idea. Um, I think it allows a better concentration of expertise and skills. It gives you more strength in the marketplace through economies of scale. It allows you to deliver a pipeline of work over a longer period of time and gives you um, the opportunity for better community wealth building. And I can't speak any faster. So thank you, David, and apologies for that extra additional minute. Thanks, Richard. You, you, you did get uh, an awful lot in your, your minute. So uh, we, we'll move straight on. Uh, I'm sure you'll, Richard, contribute to the questions and answers. Um, and we'll move on now to Danny McKendry, who is Principal Landscape Architect at Architecture and Design Scotland. He's a chartered landscape architect and geographer uh, with over 30 years experience in the private and public sectors working across a variety of complex projects. So, Danny, over to you. Thank you very much and to yourself and to uh, the Commission for inviting us today. Interestingly, 
Architecture and Design Scotland um, are an agency here to kind of help promote the value of design and, and, and helping everyday lives. Um, and as opposed to our previous role, which is much more about perhaps critiqu critiquing uh, proposals, etc. So our role has changed a lot. And over the last uh, few years, probably prior to COVID, um, we were already starting to think more about um, place as being the focus of our work in, in alignment with um, the, the, the work of Scottish Government. Um, we looked at uh, work around carbon conscious places um, where we were looking at principles of, of proximity, et cetera, and um, uh, how place itself could be a focus of delivering um, climate resilient places. We looked at um, how place itself could uh, help care for people, um, caring places, particularly around town centre living. Um, we've followed that up with uh, our climate action towns, looking at places which that had climate, et cetera, was less of a, a, a consideration, but perhaps provided opportunities to increase the value of land and, and availability of land in those locations. We'd done previous work around stalled spaces, meanwhile uses in certain places, which um, quite often um, helped avoid problems of, of blight in terms of, again, proximity to other sites, but also in terms of the value of those sites themselves. And we'd also been doing work around um, helping in terms of the skills around placemaking for um, staff, not so much planners and architects, but perhaps some of our colleagues within the world of housing um, for them to be, become you know, more confident uh, clients. But of course, then COVID happened and some of the work we've done, been doing became, um, I suppose, more poignant in a sense. And you know, people's uh, perceptions of, of uh, land value and where it was and, and what mattered to people and values um, associated with what um, land might be used for, for a change. And, you know, particularly down the, the toughest parts of lockdown, people became acquainted with bits of land and, and, and the adjacent uh, pieces of land and connections and um, infrastructure and, and, and connections that they maybe weren't in, uh, aware of for, in the past or certainly for a long time. So again, this idea of our proximity and the value of land and, and what land could do and, 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 and what mattered to people changed. So some of our city centres perhaps mattered less to people and perhaps um, the, the laying out their back door um, might have mattered more to them. And the piece of open green space nearby in terms of uh, that. So there was that kind of rethinking around that, I think, from people. I think there's also, um, I think in terms of the work that we've been doing, um, we've been working around um, the promotion of the place principle, which is around, really around alignment, people aligning their work internally within their organizations, particularly councils in terms of departments, but also um, aligning with uh, other stakeholders. Um, we have encouraged people to embrace the complexity, touching upon um, the previous points, um, and working with other key agencies, Architecture and Design Scotland are going in earlier, working with people, particularly around elements of green recovery. And quite often this is about uh, looking at um, difficult pieces of land that um, have are in, in important locations, but have various barriers, particularly uh, around the development of them. So again, it's about perceptions um, and, and perhaps alternative thinking about how things might be delivered there. Um, and again, helping people to become better clients. The issue of scale was mentioned before, and I think we have to get better understanding where gaps are in terms of linkages between sites, but also the value of sites themselves, what they can be used for in terms of biodiversity connection, but also um, uh, meanwhile uses in terms of the gradual incremental build out of, of, of places. Um, we have looked at sites uh, in Fife and um, some really incredible work getting done by um, people like Kingdom Housing over there. Um, Fraser Avenue is an example that I would certainly encourage people to look at where Gap sites um, that were very, very problematic, stigmatized locations have been carefully designed to darn holes in, in places, re, um, uh, reset perceptions of places, uh, recenter the gravity of, of activities, and, and really, really change the, the quality of the place and, and, and make massive changes to people's lives, you know, um, uh, in terms of you know, people's uh, perceptions of their, um, their own health, worth, et cetera. Uh, are really, really quite interesting com com coming through there. So 
what we're also seeing now um, emerging from COVID is a, a, a more of a, a sort of landscape and system scale approach to unlocking sites, looking at um, where sites are in terms of the, the overall picture of what they can do. We recently looked with um, CAG colleagues around um, Kilmarnock, where there are sites there which are, have proved difficult to develop um, just south of the, the, the central area of Kilmarnock due to flooding. Um, but where an approach to look at land elsewhere um, in terms of reuse from that um, can, uh, especially through nature based solutions, the, the, the alignment of different pieces of land to uh, and how the relationship with each other in terms of serving each other was um, has become really, really um, a, a new approach. So to, to wrap up really, just to say, we would encourage people to take a place vision approach and be clear of the different parts of land and, 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 and attributes that they want to um, uh, imbue into any conversation and be very clear about the governance and process of, of their conversations and how to develop that and who to bring in. So rather wide ranging there, but uh, hopefully that can encourage debate. Good. Thanks very much. I mean, that's uh, very useful sort of interpret or how we interpret place as an implementation at a local level. Thanks. Thanks, Danny. Right, we're going to move straight on to Fiona Kandirin, who is head of development at the Logan Council and leads on the delivery of an ambitious capital investment strategy for the local authority with a particular focus on housing and place. So we're over to you, Fiona, and we're interested to hear what contribution you have for us today. Yeah, thanks, David. I think um, one of the reasons why I moved into local government after 20 years of successfully avoiding it is to be exactly in the position that you described earlier in terms of being a place pioneer, to be honest. You know, for me, after working as a town planner and then within SFT, working in the place and housing team, it was very much a case of put your money where your mouth is and be in a place where you actually make things happen. And I felt this is an opportunity to do that. But I think for today, one of the things I'm interested in just plugging into is um, what is the role of a place pioneer in an area of growth? So the Council, it's one of the fastest growing local authorities in Scotland. It's small, but it's moving like a rocket. It's got a projected population increase of about 13.8% before 2028. That's uh, an additional 12,000 people putting into a small local authority where we're up until uh, 2019, I think we had 91,000. That's a lot of new people to accommodate, and we are accommodating them. You know, we've allocated a lot of greenfield land, which, feed it, which is feeding, obviously, the, the housing land market. So Midlothian is a bit of a boom town. So in relation to housing, what's the role of a place pioneer in that context? I think the first thing is around affordability. You know, um, uh, while we're building lots of new homes, the average price of the homes in Midlothian have, have risen from 180,000 per unit to an average of 230. And I think that's a reflection of what's getting built. So it's clean greenfield sites, large three, four, five bedroom homes being built in Midlothian at the moment. And we're now in the less kind of less exalted position of being in the, one of the most expensive places to buy a home in Scotland. So for a place pioneer, really one of the key roles there was affordability and making sure that we can actually serve at the broadest range of community in our local authority. And our own housing stock, uh, we've about 8,000 homes in Midlothian Council, and we're in the course of delivering a thousand unit programme. And that's largely because, you know, until recently, our, our stock was quite static. It's really high demand, doesn't tend to move very much. So as a place pioneer, what we really had to do was build. And what we're trying to build is a, a lot more diverse than what's being offered in the market as well. So that's the second part of what being a place pioneer in an area of growth is. It's affordability and making sure that actually there's homes that people can afford across kind of a range of needs. And the second thing is around what people actually get to live in. So whenever we build homes, we look at the demand analysis on our housing register, 8,000 people looking for a home at the moment in Midlothian and see you know, what size of home, what kind of home is gonna get built. And if you look at our ship at the moment, I think we've got just over 2,000 homes being built in the next five years in the area, hopefully, if all goes well. Um, about a quarter of those are for specialist needs. So that's for amenity housing, co-housing, it's uh, for spe uh, wheelchair use, people with spe specialist needs. So that doesn't obviously get offered um, by the private sector. So it really needs a pioneer to go in there and make sure that that actually happens within the housing programme. So I would say diversity of what's being offered is really important as well. And also in, in terms of house types, you know, not everybody can afford that three, four bedroom home. So making sure that smaller and more affordable homes are also built, also really key. The other thing I'd add on to being a pioneer, and I suppose one of the things that really attracted me to work in the loading is that even in an area of growth, there's places where the commercial market will not go. So we have uh, town centres in Midlothian that aren't really fit for purpose and 
to my mind, you know, a built environment is a real reflection of uh, how you view a community. So what do you build needs to reflect the esteem that you hold people in. So what people get to spend their time in, in the public realm has to measure up to what your, what your aspirations are for your community. So at the moment, I think we would say our town centres don't really deliver on that. So in Dalkeith and Newton Grange and elsewhere, you know, we have real aspirations for making these better places. But we also know that the private sector isn't going to provide the solution to that. We, we know that that's on us. Uh, so we know that we're going to have to utilise the housing revenue account, uh, you know, do, do housing ledger generation. But we also know that that's possibly not going to be enough either. And, you know, the, the work I did at uh, Grant and Waterfront before I moved to Midlothian really flagged up the importance of that partnership working with Scottish Government and others who can bring funding in to help support those pioneering roles. Because when there is no market there to support you, you need all the help you can get. And for example, I know um, the Vacant Derelict Land Fund uh, have recently agreed to fund Western Villages in Edinburgh. And that's a really essential part of that first phase of development. You know, other aspects of that are just going to be just as important for smaller town centre regeneration sites, which are complex and expensive to do. And where local authority at the moment, you know, we're really caught in the crux of rising costs um, in terms of build, build what we're going to build. Uh, lack of skills and also you know just um, we obviously have a, a relatively static level of grant available to us for, for the affordable housing albeit it's gone up but still that doesn't cover the overall cost of it so while we can invest and we can borrow and invest in it you know that risk needs to be shared amongst partners I feel as well so we're all doing that together so that's really what I felt uh, I wanted to bring today in terms of the role of Price Pioneer in the Lillian area of growth. You know, even with an area growth, lots of things still fall through the cracks and there's still a role for organisations such as ourselves around affordability, diversity, choice, and also addressing that regeneration piece. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks very much. And uh, thanks for all presenting us with, with, with a very succinct summary of those key issues. Um, so without further ado, we're going to move on to Neil Rutherford. Uh, Neil leads the investment place and housing teams at Scottish Futures Trust. His extensive experience in the delivery and innovation across key areas of the economy, um, especially in terms of economic growth, digital connectivity and housing. So uh, Neil, over to you, we're interested to hear what you have to say. Cool, th th thank you, David. I mean, I, I guess as a speaker, probably a lot of the things that have been said already, we take those and we funnel them down and then we get to this point of, we know what we're trying to do, but we just don't know how to do it. So a big part of the the, the, the last 11 years at SFT and before that is really about be, being about exactly that, innovation, new ways, new approaches, all these wonderful things that we do. But really that's about delivery and additionality. So the things that we do, they give us another way of, of maximizing uh, the, the land available to us, the, the, the maximizing the delivery of the number of units across different types and tenures. It's about ensuring enabling infrastructure uh, 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 and the partnerships that make that all happen. But part of that is also understanding the wider levers that we have as the public sector. How do you use them to drive change uh, 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 and do something differently? Um, what the work's also shown us, and I think for Place Pioneers, it feels like there's an umbrella heading there. There are already probably a number of things that you could badge as Place Pioneers, draw upon, learn from, um, tweak to potentially trial other things. But, 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 but really, you know, it gives us a series of building blocks that we can cherry pick from. We can use them again. They may be relevant in some places. And I think that point about scale and location, I guess through all the things I've worked on over the last few years, um, there isn't a single solution. There's lots of different tools. They work in different places. You have to figure out what works in those different locations and for different scales. And they're all important because they're all about building places uh, and delivering change. So really, again, Bit of, a, bit of a naff title, but you know, growing the toolbox. What are all the things that are in there that we can use and that we can repurpose, tweak, and so forth? Um, for me, I think the, the, the idea behind the Place Pioneers being proactive is a key one. I think if I've done anything over the last year, it is about being proactive, grasping a challenge, and trying to solve it. I, I think by being passive or sitting back and expecting others to do some of these things, that's where challenges arise. So as you say, David, I think about 
how resources, how I use my time, how I make a difference. I think the police pioneers is really, you know, it draws, as you said up front, it, it draws that in. Um, I mean, I guess for me, in terms of where we are going in the future, the kinds of things we're looking at, uh, and people on the call will be hopefully familiar with some of it. Um, we're looking at potentially the role of councils, you know, can they build homes for private sale and rent where the market's not working? How do you use some of the, the, the land and assets that we have to do that? We're engaging with a latch around that. We'd like to start looking at some example sites, if you like. And I guess with a lot of this, almost again of how do, you, you know, it's like a jigsaw, how do place pioneers, you know, if the, that kind of thinking, how does it fit together or is it this stuff or, you know, how do we all learn from what we're doing? We're looking at town centres like, like like many are, uh, many others are. We're working in partnership with a number of people on the, the, the panel. Um, and that links to another um, activity that we're doing around connected hubs, so workspaces in towns and villages. So working with, you know, again, partners about that local working, um, local assets, local footfall, minimising uh, carbon footprint. Uh, and uh, using redundant and underutilized assets. But key part of that has actually been about working with the private sector. So you have assets, how do we use them? How how do we get you to treat them in a different way uh, 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 and effectively maybe give back or create the right conditions for future success? We're looking at some, some elements around shared um, ownership uh, uh, and also institutional investment in affordable housing, how that might help us deliver a, a, a scale and again in certain locations. So, so I think that's slightly off piece, but I guess what what that has has shown me is, uh, and what I've learned is almost the role of funding and financing. How does it fit? How does it work? Is it the right tool? Is it not the right tool? We need to think about those things for place pioneers. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, as, as we were talking about before this, uh, and a colleague were, would say, there were three things that I, I guess, again, from my experience to, to again, help the place pioneers that, that are quite important. I think that collaboration and coordination uh, across different partners and organizations is key. Um, so the being cited on what is happening or what is going to happen is a big part of this. Are we doing the right things in the right places? By having that coordination and collaboration, it actually makes it easier to unlock resources and skills and expertise and, and, and buy-in. Um, and, and with that, what it allows us to do is think about the outcomes. Because as with all of this stuff, what we're actually doing is more about what we can achieve than a physical asset. I work in infrastructure. Generally, we build things out of bricks and, and, and other materials. But actually, it's about what it achieves. And I think for police pioneers, that again is a big aspect of this of if you get it right actually makes a huge change in what we can drive but um that was really me uh, it covers a sort of a wide a, a wide range of areas but um it was more about a little bit of my experience and sitting in these similar kinds of spaces and, and, and delivering new ways so thank you oh you're on mute david Thanks, Neil. That, that, that's a very helpful input into um, producing places and, and, and what the range of experience you've had. So uh, let's move straight on now to, to Mike, to, to, to Mike Staples, who is Chief Executive of the South of Scotland Community Housing, currently working on around 25, around 25 communities providing support to a range of mixed housing and regeneration projects. Uh, Mike has worked in strategic regeneration housing for over 20 years and is also a board member of Community Land Scotland. So over to you, Mike. Okay, uh, thank you, David, and, and also thank you to the commission for, for the invite. And uh, we were really pleased to see the recognition of community light housing within uh, some of the work uh, around um, place pioneers and within the report into land for housing more generally. Um, for those of you that don't know us, we're an organization uh, that provides support to the planning and delivery of community light housing across uh, the south of Scotland as an enabler. Um, and uh, I think we regard the community organisations uh, that we work with in many cases to be uh, community-led place pioneers. Um, 
it's very important to us that the projects we are supporting and the communities we're supporting are thinking about community-led housing from that more holistic perspective of how housing fits into the wider perspective of place planning, uh, promoting community resilience and being able to address through community-led regeneration and partnership some of those wider challenges that we face. Um, we've, uh, we've sort of categorised our community organisations and how they fit to this agenda into those that are rural, smaller towns, and then an interesting area for, for, of work for us is, is the urban work that, that we've been doing. So I'll talk a little bit about each of those. For the rural work, uh, the more recognisable side of community-led housing delivery in Scotland um, and uh, really driven by communities, particularly delivering new housing, uh, low energy housing, mixed development, and the kind of hub approach uh, that was being referred to by, by Neil and uh, really reaching towards uh, creating more sustainable communities. Uh, we found recently that the narrative around housing supply in the south of Scotland has really shifted uh, very quickly accelerating a lot of the issues around second home ownership, post-COVID, very hot housing market here that we've never had previously, and more and more communities are wanting to become engaged in addressing these issues themselves um, and developing that culture. Uh, one project we uh, recently delivered uh, in Closeburn uh, was Scotland's first passive certified homes. Uh, winner of the Surf Award in housing last year. And we feel this is a very good example of a community whose vision, which was all about repopulating with new families, but also addressing climate emergency and fuel poverty, uh, has, has been really significant in setting uh, a, a tone for uh, new projects that, that we undertake and very much illustrating that these guys are pioneers. A lot of the work that we've done uh, recently has also been in smaller towns and taking this idea of uh, vacant and derelict, long-term empty buildings, gap sites, empty homes, and, and enacting the delivery of these via community-led solutions. The focus here for us on smaller towns is that the Rural Housing Fund is the only piece of the affordable housing uh, funding jigsaw in Scotland as things stand that's open to community organisations. Um, project example, again, for us, we've recently completed a project in Langham uh, in the east of, the, of Dumfries and Galloway on the former police station, which was a property that had been empty, disused for 15 years in ownership of the local authority. And here, community asset transfer from Dumfries and Galloway Council has enacted uh, a process of community ownership, redevelopment of a heritage asset, uh, a painstaking uh, restoration of, of a, a listed building, which is now four flats and really aligns to a lot of the wider strategic regeneration, economic development regeneration going on in the town of Langham and a wider culture of community ownership there. Um, the last piece I wanted to talk about was around the urban work and, and in particular, you know, I think we consider this a really important area of, of opportunity for community led housing. Um, in particular, we've been supporting the Mid Steeple Quarter project in Dumfries uh, since about 2017. Um, I'm sure it's a project that people are well aware of, but it really relates to uh, a community organisation attempting to enact the strategic urban regeneration of a high street block uh, uh, um, via a process of community ownership. Uh, the project relates to eight properties. It came about after a prolonged seven, eight year period of community engagement, uh, leading to the establishment of a community benefit society. And now the master planned area, uh, which involves somewhere in the region of 60 homes is being delivered. Um, five of the eight uh, units are in, are in community ownership now. And here we have a whole range of really consistent themes around I'm mentioning their absentee ownership, high street decline, retail decline, depopulation because the upper floors above empty shops are closed off and not being used, dereliction, and a community led but partnership driven solution to that. And the really hard part of this, because of the funding landscape, has been delivering the housing. 
um, I, and there I am going to stop. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, thank you to all our speakers for uh, a wide range of perspectives, and I think that's going to get the discussion going. If people have questions, could you please uh, post them in the chat now, and then I'll pick them up. But I first of all want to talk about the issue of value that, that, that a number of our speakers have raised, and I'm going to do that by contrasting um, place-based development for when I've written about this, I, I've tended to contrast it with the concept of, of what are called default urbanism. In other words, the, the kind of second-rate places that we see time and time again when people really couldn't be bothered to do better. Now, how do you convince, uh, when I say your clients, that might be um, a housing association, it may be local politicians, it may be whoever you're reporting to, um, not to sell off that piece of land immediately for the whatever sum of money they can get, but actually think about it in terms of an investment in place and to use the land resources um, to actually get something much better, even if, as, as Richard says, that's highly complex and takes time. So I think the question I've got for all of you, maybe we'll start with Richard. How do you actually convince the people who you have to convince to go for sort of a long-term um, investment in place rather than, should we say, getting out as quickly as possible and getting whatever cash you can as quickly as possible. Richard, do you want to pick that Thank, up? Thanks, David. In interesting. I was, I was fascinated listening to Fiona. Actually, I was actually in Midlothian a couple of weeks ago and I was struck by how two places can be so different. <laughs> you know, the, the challenge in Western Bartonshire has never been and then actually in, in a large part of Glasgow city region has never been about, you know, foregoing early opportunity, you know, for, for something else. It's been much more about trying to attract investment into places and viewing the world from that context, it has been much more about persuading politicians in particular to be prepared to invest either in advance of or alongside other investment to make development happen and and that is you know that is the polar opposite i think of the drivers the economic drivers that work in midlothian which i found really interesting um so what would you what you what's the trick to that persuasion richard well i'll tell you the simple version of the trick uh, the, the simple version is goes something like this look if we manage to build a thousand houses and we occupy them all. Firstly, if you've got net population decline, which Western Barton, for example, has, it helps to arrest population decline. If they're family homes, it helps to address population decline in the wrong, long term. And if they're decent sized homes, incidentally, each one of them is worth about 1500 a year in council tax, which over 50 years means that's a significant revenue stream. Whereas at the moment, that piece of vacant and derelict land is delivering precisely nil. Therefore, Let's give it a go. Good. OK, Fiona, do you want to come in and just how, how do you get the message across to people about the importance of long term investment in place? I mean, with a bit of difficulty, I mean, it's it's one of these things that we broached when I was asked with it when I was in SFT working on um, the new place guide and at the heart of it is collaboration, really, you know, you have to get in there early and I mean, sometimes you can do a deal, David, you know, sometimes you can do a land deal and it works for everybody, you know, we're providing yeah. them, they're providing something for us, we'll get something out of the back end of it and hopefully we can, for example, build some homes there or we'll deliver something of a quality that we'll be proud of. But, you know, what we're actually just about to embark on doing in Midlothian is exactly to address the challenge of trying to get our our partners all on board on a single vision for Midlothian in effect you know at the moment the the council's trying to do one thing uh you know and what we really need to do is get everybody on board on that vision so we're, we're, we're starting a piece of work actually just to address exactly that type of thing so that people can see you know if you've got if you are an investor in Midlothian so whether you're public or private actually that you know we're we're, we're all marching to the same beat in terms of the kind of place that we were trying to deliver and with that, if there is corporate buy-in, and um, that means that should filter down to your property teams or whom you're trying to do the land deal with. So quite often you're just dealing with an estates team 
when you're talking about land, whereas the, you know, the, the, I suppose the more corporate teams might be the ones who talk a lot of, you know, positive words about partnership working, but when it comes down to actually thrashing out a commercial deal, it doesn't always translate. So it's actually trying to, beg, to knit those two things together. And that is a discrete piece of work, but, you know, I think it has to be done because if that partnership isn't allied, then you're going to go, you know, it's going to be much harder actually to get a deal that actually works on the ground. Um, particularly where it's, you're arguing about what comprises best value for a disposal. Um, I mean, the definition is there for interpretation, but very, quite a lot of the time, our public sector partners as well um, have a need to maximise value, maximise the receipt. And what we're trying to say to them is actually maybe focus less on that and focus on the outcomes. Okay, uh, best value. That's a that's will get us going on that for a while, I think. Um, but we've got to, uh, we'll come, might come back to that point. We've got a point coming in that, um, Mike, I think you, you, a point for you, but I think it, it might others want to answer as well. Um, question from Geraldine Woolley. How do you keep community engagement active over a seven to eight year pre-development period? Do the same people stay engaged? And what support do they need? And that's interesting that, that you, you're thinking of projects that actually go on for some time. How, how do you keep that engagement going? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's, <clears throat> that was obviously a, a specific reference to, to the Mid Steeple Quarter project. And um, uh, for those of you that don't know about the history of that project, the, the project had been actually initially catalyzed or, the, or the, the discussion around the future of Dumfries Town Centre had been catalyzed by an artist-led community development trust called the Stove Network and they actually used a, the, their knowledge and expertise and creative practice to engage in a range of different ways with the, commun the community over a number of years to build up a narrative around the future of the town centre. So it was a broader conversation about the role that Dumfries should be adopting as uh, really a kind of declining local regional centre, how, how should that relationship change? And a lot of that was pointed towards the need to repopulate the, the core. But in community-led housing, it's something we work with all the time because in order to, for the community to buy an asset, there needs to be that demonstration of community support for the outcome and viable business planning. So it's, it's, it is always a challenge and, and uh, it's really important that communities are engaged throughout. Okay, thanks. We've got a provocative comment question coming in from Noreen Fail here. So I'm going to read it out and let's see if we, we do provoke you. You can't collaborate properly as long as the big, oh, it's gone off my screen. Um, yeah, you can't collaborate properly as long as the big developers hold the council to ransom because they own the land. So land ownership is a huge barrier. Um, is that correct in, in, in your experience or not? Um, who would like to pick that up? Richard, would you like to pick up? Is that, is that a problem or not? No, well, thanks, David. I've actually just replied in the chat. Um, it's, it's not necessarily a barrier. It depends on the circumstances and the, the land in question. The example I've cited in the chat, Queen's Quay, the former John Brown shipyard, privately owned. The only way that that was ever going to be developed, and I appreciate this is not the same as some other land holdings. The only way that was ever going to be developed was a joint venture between the landowner who had stake in the game and the council who, as I've mentioned in my introduction, had long-term stake in the game and we were able to make that work and you know that site is now being developed where it had lain empty for 30 years but the developer wasn't holding on to it in terms of, well they were holding on to it in terms of the hope value uh, but we simply recognized that for them we were the only game in town okay um does anyone else want to come in on the point of working with big developers? I mean, Fiona, you were talking about, to some extent, sort of very narrow range of products that you're getting in some parts of Midlothian that need to broaden that out. Is, is that the result of the type of people are developing or, or what is it? 
Yes, I mean, in short, you know, commercial developers build to a certain market and they build to a certain price point and that's what they deliver. So, but I, I to be honest, there, there are other developers in Midlothian Active who, who are doing different things that are trying different things, but certainly in terms of the volume house builders is quite a narrow range. You know, I would say control over land is, 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 a, re, is, is a really key issue and we have a, a finite and diminishing amount of land. Um, and uh, I highlighted in the blog recently as well, in terms of our aspirations for net zero, it's much harder to deliver on aspirations for net zero through affordable housing that's coming through Section 75 agreements, for example, because they're being built at different standard by developers. So you do lose control when you don't own land. I think, um, again, there's probably a discrepancy between the situation in Midlothian where it is, you know, a buyer's market and the situation in Western Bartonshire, you know, where... The, the council is, it has it has potentially got the, a role to stimulate demand. In Middle there is a lot of demand. They don't necessarily need us, so we're in a slightly more difficult situation when it comes to, to you know, kind of having that control. Uh, I, what I would do is point out, you know, that's not to say that local authorities can't seize control through land acquisition. So looking at Grant and Waterfront, where City of Edinburgh Council, I was involved in that project team, you know, acquired that site from the private sector and and and, and other parties. And site assembled site that's going to deliver 3,600 homes in a new town in Edinburgh. So, uh, and and you know, but they will be collaborating with the private sector to do that. Though you know, there will be a partnership role in that as well. So it's not like uh, you, you have to do it yourself. But there's there is that early role for the for the for the public sector, sorry, to sometimes define the vision, to define the outcomes, and then bring in the right partners to deliver it. So I think I, I would reiterate what you're just saying, you know, the private sector are really valuable partners. Land ownership is helpful. It's not always key. Um, but yeah, if you want, if you, I suppose, if you want to deliver the outcomes, sometimes land ownership does really help there. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll, Danny, I want to bring you in here from the this point of view, because it, it, it's a related point in terms of um, different type of players, because I said at the beginning that one of the aspects of Place Pioneers was a partnership between landowner, government, and perhaps alternative types of developers, such as community bodies, housing associations, SMEs. Um, do you get any sense that different types of developers have different commitments to place and perhaps public authorities perhaps ought to be a bit more selective than they are on the types of developers that they go into partnership with? Well, regarding the, the final point there, I mean, I think um, sometimes there is a choice, sometimes there's less of a choice. But I think that um, it's interesting. I mean, some of the experience, and I mentioned Fraser Avenue earlier on, some of the local um, housing associations. The interesting thing there, of course, they have got a long term um, commitment to places in the same way as local authorities have. You know, they're not going away. You know, they, they tend to be placed or certainly um, regionally uh, specific and what I you know reflecting in one of the earlier questions uh, I think is quite interesting is that they quite often have kind of local champions who can stick with it get to know the, the communities very well and build up a sense of trust they also are kind of uh, you know have that tenacity locally that is required from local uh, players and um, but I, I, I think, um, so I think that's, uh, that's really uh, is something that, you know, um, is, is important and, and quite often, you know, somebody mentioned six or seven years, quite often there's, a, we've looked at almost like 10 year cycles in, in, um, that are required. Uh, but so, and, and it's almost starting to approach onto generationally, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the relevance of, of these organizations. So I think, I think they can be um, really, really important. I think the other thing I was, I think it's important is that no matter who owns the land or who is developing it, the council has that you know big role that was mentioned, um, where they have that overview, both in terms of potentially you know in terms of the bigger plans and what happens when, but also they have the view of how the sites are connected potentially. So there's that kind of thing about that focus on where the linkages may be, the connections, the green and blue infrastructure that actually start to make sense of developments. And, and, and in terms of the creation of places um, with a view to a vision. So I think there's a, there's a, um, I think there's a, a real kind of importance of the, the, the local authorities overview that committed backer of projects, but that kind of um, uh, coordinator. So, you know, I think place pioneers, one of the mentioned words that I, I mentioned earlier is tenacity. I think there needs to be that range of tenacity across the various players. 
thanks so much. I'm, I'm just going to pick up a, a question. I'm just going to paraphrase it on, on, on the national planning framework. I guess the question, what, what can we hope for from the national planning framework um, that is going to perhaps prioritise these issues a bit more than the last one? Um, Neil, do you want to um, talk about that? From, from the, what, what, what could we expect the government, parliament to come up with um, that, that would help here in the, in the forthcoming MPF4? Yeah, so, 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 so I guess probably some of the elements we've talked about already, you know, that um, enshrining of place, low carbon, inclusive economy, you, you know, those principles cascading through and what it means when it gets down to delivery. So um, this is probably a good question for, you, for Fiona um, as well. But um, I, I think the answer is yes. So to, to be honest, yes, there is. And, and, and the, the, there are more layers to it. But MPF 4 I think the way that we're looking at it is, you know, town centres, how, how does it pick up on those kinds of things? How does it support them? How, how does it um, shape the world that that will be a focus? So um, very much so. That's not a great answer, David, but, but yes, I think it's just the simple answer. Well, I'm going to bring Fiona in, but I'm going to ask just to pick up on that. And Fiona, um, would it be helpful if the NPF was clearer on what it was not going to allow as much as what it was going to allow? Should it be harder and more decisive on saying this, this kind of development, this kind of place, under no circumstances we're having it? Um, and that then might prompt people to move towards the kind of things we've been talking about, or, or does it just become, do, does it remain sort of fairly vague? Well, I think that the more kind of funneling of people towards a similar set of conclusions and outcomes about what we should be delivering is always helpful. Um, and the, the narrowing of the gap between the different sectors who are building and delivering is, is always helpful. I mean, I do believe, though, that everything that we need to do place pioneering work is, is in place, apart from money. <laughs> the, does the MPF4 give me money, David? No, it does not. So, <laughs> uh, so you know, uh, money, resources, skills, those all the same boring things. But, you know, ultimately, we, we should all know what we should be trying to do. We should all know what the outcome should be. I think MPF4 will be helpful in actually battling that out, I think, definitely across the different parts of the Scottish government, for example, having more corporate, um, you know, a, a, a more corporate approach to that, that will make collaboration with our partners more, more, you know, more, more helpful, and that, in a sense, will help with delivery. But ultimately, one of the key difficulties here is around delivery, and that does come down to some of the more brass tacks. That's it, and with the MPF4, I think. So, you were saying earlier on in terms of um, the council's own access to land shrinking i think if i if i understood you correctly um how does that impact on what i call your power relations between what the council might want to achieve and, and, and what it has to accept but it because it it's not necessarily in control of that would would you um be better placed if you could expand your own uh, land holdings, or for example, if we had the kind of land agency that, that the um, Scottish Land Commission has proposed in, it, in its recent report to facilitate and help councils get access to land, would that would that help the place agenda? Or yeah, I mean, I think the land agency uh, proposal uh, is definitely could be one of the potential kind of sig most significant elements of that. You know, I, I think working on a similar basis with our strategic partners in the public sector, taking one sector approach, to, one, a one public sector approach to, to land would be really helpful. Whether that needs an agency behind it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but it would probably help. Um, but it's a, it's a big hammer. Um, at the same time, you know, the, in, in the meantime, I suppose what we need to do is work with our partners in, in the public sector to, to gain access to, to land. But it's there, there isn't a magic button. There isn't a magic solution to that. Ultimately, I think um, having a, a one public sector approach to affordable housing in particular, whereby they recognize the, the need for and the public good nature of affordable housing and the fact that that is a really valuable thing to do with their surplus land will be hugely influential. And as I say, a land industry behind sitting behind that to actually do the, the assembly work around that would be, you know, is a really interesting idea. 
Um, but yes, at the moment we're a bit like a hamster in a wheel, whereby you know uh, we're building off you know surplus primary school sites and surplus council sites, and we'll, we'll probably be going through a rationalisation process like an awful lot of local authorities post COVID. See what other property do we need to maintain? How we deliver services? So all that will generate more land for us to work with. Um, but at the same time, it is a finite supply. And the more that we can bring in our partners in that, um, the better. Great, thanks very much. Um, we're, we're nearly time. So can I first of all, thank Richard, Danny, Fiona, Neil, and Mike for uh, their presentations and their, their very insightful contributions to, to the discussion. Um, can I encourage you all to complete uh, the feedback form? Uh, that, that, that will be coming shortly. And can I give a plug for the uh, sessions tomorrow in Scottish Land Commission's conference? We have two sessions in the morning on land rights and responsibilities. Uh, we have a session in the first half of the afternoon on land governance and new models, potential new models for land governance. And finally, to conclude the conference, uh, we have a session that, that I'm sure will be of interest on the vacant and derelict land investment program. Uh, number of speakers including Tom Arthur the Minister for Public Finance Planning and Community Wealth so thanks everyone for their involvement today and hopefully uh, as a lot of you can can join us tomorrow thank you bye-bye